Patrick is the, is the Leonard Arrington Chair of um, Mormon History and Culture, is that right? Yeah, at uh, Utah State University. Uh, he's an invaluable contributor to Faith Matters, obviously. Uh, he's the author of several books, inclu including Planted, Proclaim Peace, which is terrific, and, uh, and Restoration, which we published. And after Patrick uh, shares his thoughts, he's going to sit down in conversation with uh, Don Dimmick uh, for just a brief conversation. Don uh, earned degrees in religious studies and international studies from USU, where she was a student of Patrick's and is currently on track to receive her MA in chaplaincy from BYU and plans to be an army chaplain. So, uh, sounds fascinating. Patrick, yours. It is really great to be here uh, tonight. It's a little after five o'clock right now. So I figure we've got till about 1 a.m. because contractually I only speak in eight hour segments now. Some of you get that joke. All right, so, uh, so when, they, when they decided, who are we gonna get to talk about the future? Nobody does that better than historians. That's what we are trained to do. And so I'm gonna bring all of my many years of professional training to thinking about what the third century of the Restoration might look like. Now I'm gonna start with some bad news. You all have seen charts like this. A recent study that uh, looks at uh, the future of religion in America. This is a recent study by the Pew Forum that uh, projects that if things keep going the way they are going, then uh, within the next 50 years, Christians will represent a minority within this country. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see that, uh, that's, that that downward curve for Christians is being met by an upward curve of, of those who are not affiliated with any religion at all. Okay? And so for a lot of people, they're experiencing this as, as bad news, as the, you know, I mean, a little bit of the, the sky is falling and, and what's actually our life going to look like uh, in a, in a post-Christian world. So what some people, as, as they've looked at this, as they've looked at what they call a post-Christian world, so a very famous book was published a few years ago by a guy named Rod Dreher. He's a, a, a conservative author, uh, an Orthodox Christian. He wrote this famous book called The Benedict Option. And on the dust jacket of it, he says, today a new post-Christian barbarism reigns. And what is needed, he says, is a Benedict strategy a Benedict option, a strategy that draws on the authority of Scripture, the wisdom of the ancient church, and the goal, Dreyer said, was to embrace exile from the mainstream culture and construct a resilient counterculture. Now, I think, actually, Dreyer has a lot of good ideas. I agree with him a lot of, about a lot of things. I think that it's important to create resilient countercultures. But, um, you know, we, we know from our own history, and I've seen enough prestige TV that when people go out in the wilderness, stuff gets weird. <laughs> right? And uh, we have our own experience with this. And we came out into the wilderness and stuff got a little weird. All right? I'm not convinced that even in a post-Christian world, that exile is the right option that going into the wilderness is the right option, even if it was an option for us in the 21st century, which I'm not sure that it is. So we've had that experience of being pioneers, of going out into the wilderness, of exiling ourselves from society, exiling ourselves from the culture. And of course, then that turned into the 20th century, into the second century of Mormonism, which was phenomenally successful for our people where we traded in that exile, we traded in that withdrawal, traded in that kingdom building for saying, you know what, we, it's kind of nice to be like other people too. And we built a culture among the nations instead of apart from the nations. And we all benefit from this. This is the church that, that we build, our parents built, our grandparents built over the last century. And this is a church that has brought enormous prestige and reputation and influence and all kinds of goods that, that we have now as we're on the cusp of the third century of the Restoration. So I think now the question for us is where do we go from here? 
And, uh, and I just, I've got lots of ideas, but I just want to share two ideas tonight of where I think we go in the Restoration's third century. First thing is I think we need to learn to love the world. We've spent too much time turning our back on the world. We spent too much time talking bad about the world, like the world is a bad thing. But guess what? The foundational claim of Christianity, the most famous scripture of Christianity, the most important doctrine of Christianity is that God so loved the world. He loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten son into the world. We call this the doctrine of the incarnation. God didn't turn his back on the world. He didn't wait for the destruction of the world. He sent his son into the world to redeem the world with love. This is what we call the incarnation. It is the fundamental doctrine of the restoration. I'm really bad with clickers. All right? And then what Jesus did is he says, it's not enough for Jesus to come into the world to save the world with love, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. But he said, I want you to do the same. Go ye into the world. The Great Commission. Jesus asks us to incarnate the gospel into the world, to bring the gospel of love to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. He wants us to do the work that Jesus did when he came into the world. Now, I think we do this in a lot of ways. I think we've, we've been successful at this in many ways, but I think we've also been captivated sometimes not enough by love, but sometimes too much by fear. And this is not what the Lord has for us. It's not what he has in mind. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Sisters and brothers, I'm tired of being afraid. I'm tired of being afraid of the world. I'm tired of being afraid of ex-Mormons. I'm tired of being afraid of doubt. I'm tired of being afraid of TBMs and of liberals and of conservatives and general authorities and everybody else. I'm tired of being afraid of other people. So instead, what God calls us to is not fear of the other, but God calls us to the power of faith and faithfulness. God calls us to live our lives with integrity, to build uh, lives of rigorous intellect and a sound mind, and most of all, to come into the world with love. Now, this, this scripture has um, sort of laid itself on my heart over the past several months, and uh, I kept reflecting on it over and over and over again, that God has not given us the spirit of fear. And um, I woke up one morning a few weeks ago uh, with something that I can only call a revelation, a prompting, inspiration, and it said, go on Mormon stories. <laughs> and I said, God, that is a terrible idea. <laughs> and I said, and uh, I, uh, I reached out to John that same day, sent him an email, uh, and he was like, all right, let's do this thing. And I was scared. I wasn't scared of John because John promised me that he would treat me with love and respect, and he did. I wasn't scared of what I would say because I know what's in my heart and what's in my mind, and I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I was afraid that people might not understand what I was trying to do there, what we were trying to do there. I was afraid that people might feel betrayed, might feel confused, might not be sure what's going on here. But I have to say, it has been so gratifying to see that our community wants to be a place where we build bridges, where we want to have conversations. And what John and Margie and I did for eight long hours, I've said that anybody who watches the whole thing, like, we got to be giving out t-shirts or certificates or, like, like a bumper sticker, like, I survived eight hours of this, right? Uh, but all we did, we didn't do anything special, except we sat down together and treated each other like human beings. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. 
we can disagree about things. We, can, we walked out of that room, we still disagree about the same things that we disagreed about before we walked into the room. It doesn't matter because we are sisters and brothers who inhabit this world together. And we can treat one another with love and with respect and with generosity and with humility. And maybe, just maybe, we can have a little less fear for the other. So I think God calls us to that. Okay? Second thing. All right, so first of all, God calls us to love the world, to love all the creations in the world. What else does the second century or the third century of the restoration look like? Now, this is a little bit of a crazy idea. Hang with me. Okay? This is more radical, I think, than the Benedict option. This is going to take us into different directions, so maybe a little uncomfortable. I think in the third century of the restoration, we need to become the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. All right? Okay, now hang, hang with me, okay? Now, I know this is, I'm not a marketing guy. I'm not a branding guy. I know this is terrible. It's way too long. Nobody's ever going to go for it, okay? The name is, nobody's going to remember it. They're not going to want to say it. It's just, it's way too long. It would be much better if we could come up with a term that had some, it was short, it was catchy, had some kind of resonance with our main book of scripture, some kind of ism, like, I don't, like pearlism or DNCism or something like ism. I don't know, again, I'm not, a, I'm not, help me out. Come to me if you have any ideas of what, what this might be, okay? But this is the best I could come up with. I'd only had a few, you know, a few days, a few weeks to think about this, okay. Uh, but, but seriously, like I, like, I love being Mormon. I love being part of Mormon culture, Mormon people, Mormon tradition, all that kind of stuff. But, uh, and I've done my share of grumbling about the name thing, okay? But here's the thing. When it comes to the church, I agree 100%. What we want to be, what we want to become, is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And here's what I mean by that. Okay, let's start with the first part. If we're, going to be, if we're going to call ourselves the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, then we need to work a little harder at becoming the Church of Jesus Christ, of doing the kinds of things in the church that Jesus did when he was in the world. Now, let's think about what Jesus did. When Jesus began his ministry, the first public act he did was to stand up in the synagogue in Nazareth, in his hometown. Here was a hometown boy. He gets up, and he opens the scroll to the book of Isaiah. And he reads this messianic prophecy. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. And I want you to think about Jesus' ministry over the next three years and the next 2,000 years and throughout all of eternity. Yes, Jesus went to those who were poor in spirit. But Jesus' ministry is also to those who suffer from interge intergenerational poverty, who don't know where the next meal is going to come from who are on the streets and don't have enough money, who don't know how they're going to take care of their kids. Jesus is the Messiah of the poor. Yes, Jesus ministers to those with broken hearts and contrite spirits. But he also cares about the people whose hearts are broken because of divorce and because of faith crisis and because of wayward children and because of betrayal and because of all kinds of things that break our hearts. Jesus is the Messiah of the brokenhearted. And yes, Jesus preaches liberty to those who are spiritually captive. But he also liberates the people who are felons who find their way to the other side. That's the work of Jesus. The people who are in bondage to debt, to addiction, to bad relationships, to their past, Jesus is the Messiah of the captive. 
Yes, he healed those who were spiritually blind, but he also goes to those who are actually blind and deaf and lame and halt, whose bodies don't serve them the way that they wished they wanted to. Jesus is the Messiah of the disabled. And who among us is not bruised spiritually, physically, emotionally from this world? Jesus is the Messiah of the bruised. So if Jesus is the Messiah of the poor, if Jesus is the Messiah of the brokenhearted, if he is the Messiah of the captive and the blind and the bruised, and if we call ourselves the followers of Jesus Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, then Jesus' mission becomes our mission. And we are called to the poor, to the brokenhearted, to the captive, to the blind, to the bruised. This is what it means to be the church of Jesus Christ. His mission is our mission. In the third century of the Restoration, we take the faith of our mothers and fathers, we combine it to all of the success that we achieved in our second Restoration, and we apply all of that to ministering to the poor, the brokenhearted, the captive, the blind, the bruised. That's what the third century of the Restoration looks like. All right, so I want to talk about what this looks like for people. So, we, so we've talked about the Church of Jesus Christ. Well, what about this other part, Latter Days? Okay, uh, you know it's always funny when I talk to people like when they try to translate Latter Days. I've talked to like the people in the church translation department. They're trying to like translate Latter Days into other languages, and probably some of you have experienced this if you go on missions or from other places. Like, it just always makes us sound like the weirdest apocalyptic end times group. It's like Latter Days just does. I mean, it's bad enough in English. In other languages, like oh man, all right. You wonder why people aren't flocking to this church, okay? <laughs> All right? So but let's see what we can do to, to resuscitate this notion of latter days, okay? I'm not much of an apocalyptic prophet. I'm generally a pretty upbeat guy. But the fact is that for a lot of our sisters and brothers, they do live in the latter days. If you have a tank rolling down your street and a soldier knocking at your door, you live in the latter days. If you're worried that because of your racial or sexual or gendered or national or religious identity that you may be the victim of violence, you live in the latter days. If you're not sure where your next meal is going to come from or how you're going to feed your children, if literally because of food insecurity that leads to starvation, you live in the latter days. If you live in a place where people casually talk about civil war and the upheaval and the overturning of democratic institutions, you live in the latter days. If you live in a world where with the touch of a button, an unstable leader could wreak nuclear annihilation on other human beings, you live in the latter days. If you live on a planet where our treatment of Mother Earth is leading to the choking out of life, to islands disappearing, to natural disasters occurring with greater ferocity than we've ever seen, where the very question of life becomes a question for all of us, then you live in the latter days. So yes, we live in the latter days. What are we going to do about it? Well, the Latter-day Saints are going to save the world. Latter-day Saints are going to be peacemakers. We're going to transform violent conflict and bring peace to the world. Latter-day Saints are going to heal people's bodies. Latter-day Saints are going to heal people's souls. Latter-day Saints are going to build green developments. Latter-day Saints are going to teach children. Latter-day Saints are going to be climate scientists to solve the climate crisis. Latter-day Saints are going to help formerly incarcerated felons. Latter-day Saints are going to work for justice all over the world. Latter-day Saints are going to save the world. That's what we're going to do in the third century. We're going to save the world. Now, 
we're not going to do it alone. Okay. <laughs> It's a big world, and there are so few of us. There are so few of us. It's kind of pathetic. Like, to say that we're going to save the world, it's the most audacious thing in the world, and it is true. But we're not going to do it alone. We're going to do it in partnership with other people. We're going to learn from other people, people of goodwill all around the world, whether they're religious or secular, whether they're from governments or nonprofit organizations, we're going to partner with those people. Sometimes we're, we'll provide leadership. Sometimes we'll just provide people power. Sometimes we'll provide finan financial resources. We will partner with whoever, wherever, whenever. People are working to save the world. We're not going to do it alone. Nephi said, you know, we got, we got in the 1980s when I was growing up, you know, when Nancy Reagan was saying don't do drugs, we were getting high on our own supply of church growth, all right? <laughs> we were so addicted to, like, those numbers, right? We loved the membership report. We loved seeing, like, those graphs. We loved sociologists telling us that there's going to be 250 million Mormons by 2050, right? We loved all that. And once that all stopped, we we're like, hmm. We're building temples. Yeah, that's what we're going to talk about, right? You get a temple, you get a temple, you get a temple, okay? So we love that, right? So we love that. I mean, that's great, okay? But what Nephi tells us, right, is that we were never going to take over the world. Our dominions were always going to be small. Jesus knew this. What did Jesus tell his disciples? He used three metaphors to tell his disciples how they were going to influence the world. He said, you're going to be the salt of the world. You're going to be the light of the world. You're going to be the yeast. Each of these things on their own is tiny. It's infinitesimal in relation to the whole. Just a little pinch of salt takes an ordinary dish and transforms it into something amazing. A room full of darkness, invisible particles of light, transform it. And a loaf, a, a lump of flour and a few other ingredients, you add yeast to it and it rises. It transforms it. We're not called to be the critical mass. We're not called to, to be everywhere and to be everything and to build a new Christendom or anything like that. We're called to be the yeast. You can't be the yeast. The yeast does no good if it's not kneaded into the dough. We've got to love the world, we've got to be in the world, we've got to know what the world's concerns are, and we've got to be kneaded into the dough so that it can rise. Latter-day Saints, we have to love the world so that we can transform the world. It's not so that we can become the loaf. We will always just be the yeast, but that's all Jesus calls us to be. So in the Restoration's third century, we're going to use all of the faith of our mothers and fathers. We're going to use the power of our covenants. We're going to use the insight, the wisdom, the depth, the spiritual power that comes from the Book of Mormon and other restoration scriptures. And all of this will fuel our community, and that will become the rocket fuel for us to go out and save the world. And we will do it not in spite of our Latter-day Saint identity, but we're going to go and do it because we're Latter-day Saints. We're going to save the world not separate from, we're not going to go to church and then save the world Monday through Saturday. We're going to do it all the time. We're going to be 24-7 in reaching out to the world, in loving the world, in transforming the world, and being the light, the salt, the yeast that Jesus calls us to. That's all. We're just going to save the world. All right. <laughs> Where's Don? There she is. So Don, uh, I am thrilled that she's coming on stage to, to ask these questions. Don is one of these people who is changing the world. Uh, you heard Bill introduce her. Don is going to be uh, the second uh, woman who is approved by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to be an army chaplain, is that right? First army chaplain, second military. First army chaplain. Yeah. 
I have to say, Patrick pulled the, the bishop card on me. He called me on the Saturday night before sacrament meeting the <laughs> next day. So I've got my questions prepared here, and I just try to be intentional about some of the things um, that I've heard among my peers as we talk about kind of the future moving forward and just things that have come up in my ministry so far. So uh, let's just keep a good thing going. The first question I have for you, Patrick, is that you often talk about the importance of religious community and that we can do more together than on our own. And so my question is, what would you say to those who see that vision and long for that sort of community, but struggle with the dissonance of that not being their current church going reality? Yeah, no, that, this is a huge question. And when, when I talk about this or when people have read Restoration, one of the common things people say is like, that sounds amazing. I'd love to join that church. And then, <laughs> and then I go to church on Sunday, right? Um, I mean, so, so I think uh, to, to a certain degree, we have to create this, right? And um, the, the, this kind of impulse, the, the, the church here and, you know, from church headquarters is, is doing a lot of great things, and they're going to lead out on some of these things, but they're not going to do it all. Uh, and so there has to be this sense of being anxiously engaged, of sort of creating communities, creating communities of care, communities of ministry. I mean, we saw this with the other side. Uh, with the other side. Uh, am I saying that right? I feel like the other side, is that what it's called? What's that? The other side academy, right. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's people who are going to create communities, people who are going to uh, do things of their own, you know, free will and choice, uh, and, and then bring people with them. I mean, this, this is one of the great strengths of, this one of the superpowers of Latter-day Saints is, is our sense of community. Um, but I think we uh, sometimes uh, get a little bit passive in, in waiting for, uh, for other things to happen for them to us to join. Uh, but, but I think we can create a lot of things. So, so for some people, their, their Sunday worship, their Sunday observance um, is not going to be the main place that kind of feeds this part of them. Uh, and, and, uh, and I understand that, and every ward is going to be a little bit different. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be, like, the, these communities don't have to be LDS. That's the other thing. It's like, go do something, you know, go find other people who are doing great things in your community. I don't care who it is, whether it's secular, religious, you know, uh, but, uh, but join up and, and be part of that and bring your skills that, that you've learned as a Latter-day Saint uh, and as a human being and, and, and bring that to whatever needs to be done in your community. Awesome. I really love that. Bring church out. Yeah. <laughs> Living church outside of the walls of church on Sunday. Yeah. Um, so a question, a follow-up question kind of on that is as we interact with um, other faith communities and even just recently, I think it was President Oaks encouraged that and the acknowledgement and appreciation of um, other ministers and religious peoples in our communities. Some Latter-day Saints have fears that in cultivating spiritual curiosity that we'll lose religious identity. So what would you say to that? Yeah, I, I, I think this, it's, it's a false dichotomy. Uh, that, um, and, and this is where I go, it, it goes back to the very roots of our religion. Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, I mean, they were so expansive. And they said, if there's any truth out there, we want it, right? And uh, it's, it's, it's part of our religion. I mean, that, that can have a, it, it can sound a little imperial, like that's ours, right? And, and I don't think we have to be grabby in that way. But, but we can be, um, uh, we, we, we can, but we can appreciate what's out there. there there's nothing that stops us from, from learning from, participating in, the, in those kinds of things, while also being firmly re rooted in who we are. So it doesn't require you to give up the things that are precious to you, your testimony, the Book of Mormon, your, your conviction, you know, the experiences you, you have within the Latter-day Saint community, um, the, the doctrines of the gospel, uh, to, in order to, to also take from and, and learn from, uh, glean from the, the, the wisdom of the world. So, so I, think, uh, I think that's something we've lost a little bit, uh, is uh, Joseph Smith was so expansive and, and willing to, you know, uh, to, to sort of just like, where is truth and, and what, uh, what triggers his own sense of inspiration? Like, where am I finding God? Uh, I, I think we can recover some, that, that's part of what loving the world means. Mm -hmm is being able to actually appreciate the gifts that God has given uh, their children all throughout the world, uh, and, and then to be able to, to say, I, I, can, uh, you know, I, I can benefit from that and, and learn from it. Awesome. 
Um, so one of the things, you, we talked about listening and raising voices of those outside of our faith tradition and group, um, and something that's been on my mind and heart lately has been those within our faith tradition whose voices have maybe been traditionally um, on the margins. And so when you talked earlier about um, how the church as a whole was kind of on the margins in its first century and second century, how do you see the voices of those on the margins in our uh, faith tradition in the third century? Yeah, I think that this is where we can do so much better. I mean, I, 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 it goes back, for me, I think one of the tragic moments uh, in our people's past is when we arrive in Utah. So, so we, had, we had this history of dispossession, of, of being the victims of violence, being the victims, I mean, the very real victims of, of persecution. Uh, and we knew what it was like to be driven out of your home. And, and, and we came across the plains and we encountered people who were already here. And what did we do? We, we just recycled the same old thing. We, we became the Missourians. And so rather than us uh, learning those kinds of lessons and thinking about what it meant to be a marginalized people, uh, and, then, and then reaching out uh, with a different kind of relationship to, to others we found among us who were now mi minoritized and marginalized, we, we just replicated the same old power dynamics and we failed to learn the lesson that we were supposed to learn from, from our own uh, from, from the 1830s and 1840s. And so I, if, if, if we can be students of our own history, maybe the, the, the moral lesson that should come out of that should be a greater sense of empathy, of generosity, of, of recognizing, I mean, this, this, is, um, uh, I mean this, is, this is what Carolyn has, has been talking about, a sort of, I will walk with you, right? Uh, if other people won't walk with you, I will walk with you. Uh, this, this is what Elder Kieran talked about when he introduced the, the church's you know, refugee assistant programs. He said, their story is our story, right? That's what it means to be a Christian, uh, to, to be able to, 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 to see, to feel uh, other people's suffering, and, and then not to pile on, but to empathize with it, to try to re relieve it, to mourn with those that mourn, to, to bear other people's burdens. That's the heart of what it means to be a Christian. And so we, unfortunately, we became a nation like all other people, right, with the same, same kinds of power dynamics and, 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 an, and an urge towards domination and an urge towards power and those kinds of things. Uh, where, whereas the gospel of Jesus Christ is, is trying to pull us in a very different direction. Awesome, thank you. Um, something you always said in your classes that I liked was um, treating the church and the institution as something that can also need repentance as a body. Um, and with that, that the, the past remains in the present until it's processed. So I think moving forward that there's a lot of recognition we need to do on that of our yeah. past and the way we've, we've inflicted harm, so. Yeah, I mean, I learned from the church that I'm not supposed to be scared of repentance. Right. And so, uh, so, so I think collectively as a people, maybe we should be less scared of repentance. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have time for one more question. Um, I think I'm gonna take you to the bottom up, top down question I had, because we've talked about that before in your office with my own kind of struggles with institutional change and feeling called to something that wasn't uh, available to me at that time. Um, so do you feel like there is, we, we talk about um, revelation throughout all levels of the church, we're both a top down and a bottom up church. Um, is there a space for activism or what do we do when institutional change um, is happening really slowly or um, conflicts with some of our deeply held values? Yeah, I think we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I, I really believe um, uh, this, this is where the process of discernment is so important. Uh, and being able to, uh, I believe in and trust the gift of the Holy Ghost uh, that, is, that is given uh, throughout the world uh, to covenanted members of the church, but then is available to, to all of our Heavenly Parents' children. And I think each person's path is going to look a little bit different. Uh, I think uh, partly based on their own experiences, uh, their, their own situation, their own setting. Um, you know, as, as a historian, I look at the, the civil rights movement and 
uh, it took both a Malcolm X and a Martin Luther King uh, for, for us to move forward. And, and so there are, um, there's room for lots of, of voices and from, from different positions uh, and different experiences, people are gonna work for change differently. I think we need to, to be, uh, when somebody's working for change in a different way than, than I am or that, that I'm comfortable with, uh, I think our first impulse has to be what's, what's driving them towards working for change in that way. I mean, what are they really working for rather than, than approaching them with a spirit of kind of judgment or uh, in marginalization or they're doing it wrong, pointing fingers to say, why are, why are they working for this the way they are? Have they been shut out, right? Have they tried other ways and they feel shut out? Um, and unfortunately, uh, in, in our church right now, there's a lot of people who feel shut out of places of power. There's a lot of people, uh, at least 50%, who don't have access to, to certain forms of power. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and so, so then, you know, the question uh, always has to become, uh, if uh, whatever sphere of power or influence I have, whatever that looks like, at a grassroots level or an institutional level, big, small, local, general, whatever, um, the, I think the Christian impulse for leadership is how do I use my power and influence to make space, not for myself and people like me, but for other people uh, who aren't at the table right now. Amen. Thanks, Don. Thanks, everybody.